let's move on to the Twin Dilemma. Twin Dilemma plays a bigger role in my point for one reason. I mentioned how Cage of Androzani was number one on that list of 200 stories. Well, this is at the bottom. And I have one thing to say to all the fans who voted at the bottom. You have your heads up your asses. I'm sorry to sound crude, but I'm a little baffled that this is honestly considered the worst story. Really? Horns of Nyman, Warriors of the Deep, fucking loving monsters. Those don't send up any red flags. Okay. Sorry if I sound a little rude, but, um... This was not at all painful to watch. This was nowhere near the worst thing I've ever seen. I think what simply killed... I think what simply killed any interest are a few main components here. For one thing, the scene where the doctor murders per well, tries to murder Perry. That is jarring. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna argue. But here's the reason why I don't find it as well insane. It's clear that he's not that he's under some sort of odd reaction from the regeneration, so he's not thinking clearly. They make it a big part of the story. And it's played out. This doctor goes from being brave and confident to being a coward in seconds. And it's obviously some sort of strange... I guess we can call it chemical imbalance if that makes any sense. It's hard to really sell what this is. But it's safe to say it's not normal and it's not supposed to be normal. Some people instantly think, oh dear god, he's acting that crazy. And the only time I really did accuse him of being crazy is when he put the cat pin on his coat. Yes, they make a deal about that. And yes, it confuses the hell out of me too. But I should really be shocked. I'm confused, but I guess you gotta live with that. Another thing I'm pretty sure killed a lot of interest in the story are the twin Adricks. I mean, uh, the twins of the story. And for those who understand why I said the twin Adricks, I'll simply explain it by stating that, well, the Doctor had a companion who is essentially the 1980s British equivalent of Wesley Crusher. He predates Wesley Crusher. Suck on that. These guys are, of course twice the amount of annoyance, and you're never happy anytime they're on screen. This story is incredibly confusing. Now, I want to get that out of the way. This ain't perfect. This is pretty average stuff. It's a very confusing general plot, and the only thing that really does save it is Colin Baker and the fun that his mood swings sometimes do provide. And that's really all I do want to pass on here. It's not a perfect story. I will never say this would beat caves or anything big. Hell, there's even other minor stories that I would put over this. The only reason I want to defend it is so many people think it's awful when it's nowhere near that. I mean, the plot's just loads of confusing, and to understand why... This, let me just kind of get what I got out of the synopsis. Okay. So a race of giant monsters called uh, uh, the Gastropods. They took over the, They took over a planet called Jaconda. Their leader, Nestor, who... You know what? I'm not going to show you what he looks like. I'll make my point later. Intends to cause an enormous explosion in order to, to uh, raise his people's eggs through the galaxy... And he kidnaps two juvenile twin geniuses from Earth to work to work out the necessary mathematical ma mathematical ca uh, equation. Yes, his plan is to kidnap two math whizzes to spread his children across the fucking galaxy. That is where this gets a little well insanely stupid. Of course, through this they. Uh, they recruit uh, space fighters led by Lieutenant Hugo Lang, 
to get the twins back and under this and while under this Hugo meets the doctor Hugo's an interesting addition and for a while I thought they were going to make him a companion he's overly violent which is a good contrast towards Perry and the doctor Perry being an innocent teenage girl who constantly gets molested by bad guys and this doctor who's obviously a broken a broken pile of what the of what he used to be and he's trying to figure out who he was in the story and that was even technically going to be somewhat of a small arc for his doctor becoming this new somewhat extremely darker man and slowly lighten up and maybe become one of the old become more like the previous doctors kinder nicer of course his run got horribly canceled and also what doesn't help sell it is um, the phrase the doctor says at the end I'm the doctor whether you like it or not that obviously said one of two messages fuck you or it'll get better trust me but most people took it as a fuck you see the performance here and it's more in the lines of just how it's, how the character's written here wasn't warming his insane spazzes really threw people off. Hell, he even threw me off. And trust me, I loved Baker in this story. He's hamming it up 120%. He is fun to watch every second as long as he's not insane. Again, the thing that just really derails people is the scene where he's trying to kill Perry. Which, again, is a little jarring, but I understand he's not under the greatest thought process, so obviously you're not going to make the greatest thoughts. But he's oozing with doctorness. He's, it's so great that he got the role. Baker had a previous role on the show before, and he was worried that getting a role on it was going to ruin his chances. Luckily, he lived the dream, and he still continuously lives his dream for the Big Finish audio dramas. It's also good to see him interact with a past Time Lord. He meets an old one named Asmel, who's an undercover, who's a quote-unquote retired Time Lord. And it's fun to see him work with someone like this, especially since, at least from what Colin says, is his old friend. Again, I'm not sure if it's simply his memory going or he's really dedicated to his cover, but Asmel's dedicated to basically pretending he has no goddamn idea who the Doctor is, and he wants to go forward with the plan for Mester. Mester is a generic caterpillar villain who, like last time, really wants to mol Like last time, really wants to molest Perry. Now, that isn't... Now, you're wondering if this is going to be a recurring theme. Oh yeah, it probably will be, because, for those of you who may have forgotten since last review, Perry looks like this. And in her last rapist encounter, she faced a guy who looks like this. Now, in this story, she's facing something that looks like this. Yeah. If you look at it, at least you know this guy was once human. It's supposed to be this thing where I have no idea where he's planning, what he's planning on sticking where, or if he even knows human anatomy. So yeah, that's a little weird. That was more uncomfortable than the rapey thing because it just added on to Mr. Rapey's character of being an extremely dangerous, unsettling man. Here, it's just a really disgusting costume with flappy arms wanting to get busy with this hot chick. There's nothing menacing about it, it's just, I'm evil, moi. Again, with the previous villain, it was so scary and so gut-wrenching to see him act this way around an innocent girl. And by the way, she's a t she's, I think she's around 18 in this story, if not 17. So it's extremely weird. Also, I forgot to mention this, Perry's American accent is horrible. Yeah, she's a British actress with an American accent, but to be fair, I've seen a lot of Amer horrible American uh, people. I've seen a lot of horrible British accents done by American actors, so I guess this is only fair. Again, I don't know if I'm overselling this. I'm just, I feel that I have to oversell it to make it feel average. 
so and so many people consider it an abomination. Russell D. Davies even considers it the the fi- like you know the beginning of the end for the show. Mind you, it didn't get better, but it wasn't Colin Baker's fault. So many people like to blame him for it, and it's not. It's the writers, and it's just the overall direction that they were going. But that's about it. Um, again, I really hope I somehow convince you guys that this isn't one of the worst. But who knows? Peace.